Oh, it's good to see you for our first Animal Justice Academy Lunchtime Live of the new year. Woohoo! 2022! 2022. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> 2022. Um, this is um, our first session of the year today, and it's Veganic Gardening and Agriculture with the delightful Megan Kelly. And um, so I want to welcome those who are here live with us on Zoom, those of you that are on the Facebook live stream. And if you are on the Facebook live stream, come on over to the Zoom because there's lots of conversation that's going to be happening here. Um, you can get your questions in a little bit faster. Um, but uh, Kirsten is going to put the Zoom link into the live stream. And welcome to those who are new to Animal Justice Academy. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about us in a second. Um, so today with the Veganic gardening and agriculture. Not only are you going to learn about what veganic growing is, um, but why veganic farming is the future in creating a sustainable planet and how you can be a part of the veganic movement this spring by planting your own veganic garden. So um, let's see how you all are um, so far in 2022. Um, in the comments, tell us where you're joining us from and also let us know if there are any gardeners or farmers in, in the crowd, okay? So are you a gardener or are you a, a, you know, a bigger farmer? Like yeah, you have a bit more land to, to play with here. Um, and um, if you don't know where to do comments. Um, at the bottom of your screen, there is an icon uh, that says chat, and there should be like a little red balloon here. Um, and you just chat, uh, get on that and tell us where you're joining us from and if you are a gardener or a farmer. Okay, love it. Let me just see here. Hi, Debbie. You're being held hostage by your evil employer. Yes. And she says, I sprout like nobody's business. Uh, we've got Corey from Richmond, Virginia. Backyard gardener. Love it. Sarah's from Appalachian Mountains in Virginia. Veganic gardeners. Woohoo! Um, I hope we have a lot of veganic folks in the house. I'm in Los Angeles. Veganic gardener. Um, hi, Vancouver. Um, wish that I had a garden. I wish you did too. Um, uh, Kimmy and Carino are far Farmers um, from Richmond, BC. Love it. Belinda is from East Sussex, England, and she's a gardener. Albany, New York, gardener and aspiring flower farmer. Um, Barry's from Edmonton, and his wife usually grows a balcony garden outside our apartment. Uh, so that's going to be an interesting question, whether that can, well, I'm sure it can be, <laughs> and how, how to best do that uh, through the veganic approach. Sue's from England, newbie gardener with a small veg patch. Uh, South Florida backyard gardener, uh, Laz, and um, oh, just so many of you. Okay, wonderful, everybody. Dan is uh, BC uh, veggies and flower seeds going down already. You're so lucky in Vancouver. I love it. Um, okay, so folks, um, we have um, just, uh, you know, a bit of business to take care of before we uh, dive in. And the comment section is, of course, your place to play and add suggestions um, and ask questions. Um, when we uh, are opening it up for questions, I will, you know, tell you, well, you, you can know this right now. I'm going to ask you to put star, 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 Q and the question. And I'm going to ask you not to do that until we open it up to questions, just uh, otherwise they get lost in the, in the shuffle. And and um, uh, but a big welcome to any of the folks that are new here uh, to Animal Justice Academy. Uh, Animal Justice Academy um, is a training program, a community and an action collective uh, for animal advocates. And if you're not already an official AJA, -er, you can sign up for free at uh, animaljusticeacademy.com. And I think Kirsten's going to put that link in the comments. And by the way, folks, Kirsten is here taking care of you today in the chat. Kirsten, give a little wave. And it was Kirsten's birthday birthday yesterday, everybody. So happy birthday, Kirsten. <laughs> and I would say she's hung over today, but I know she doesn't drink. So, <laughs> um, so uh, let me see here a little bit of housekeeping. Um, just a reminder that we encourage chat and discussion here in the AJA community, but always respectful and always in the spirit of bridge building folks. And um, I'm sure we're not going to get heated over veganics, but it's always good to sit. Just a good reminder. Our action of the week, folks. Um, I sent this out by email. It'll be posted in the Facebook private group today. Um, 
but we are being asked to do a survey about our experience with animal rights activism that could provide animal rights activists and leaders with valuable information on how to strengthen the movement, including how to improve um, activist recruitment and how to sustain long-term participation in animal rights activism. This survey was created by AJ Ayer, um, Yasmin Coop Montero, who is a PhD student in sociology at the University of British Columbia. And she's studying animal rights activists' insights and perspectives on veganism, animals, and the animal rights movement. So um, Kirsten's going to put the link for that um, survey. But like I said, you can find it on the course platform, you can find it on the Facebook group, or you can find it in this morning's email. Um, also, just wanted to let you know our next Lunchtime Live is in two weeks. Every two weeks, we do a Lunchtime Live with the world-renowned photojournalist uh, Joanne MacArthur and Victoria DeMar uh, DeMar <laughs> Martini of uh, We Animals Media. And we'll be talking about finding the right visuals for your animal advocacy, you know, whether that's social media posts or full-on campaigns. Um, you know, the We Animals Media uh, stock site is free and it is one of the best resources we have um, in the animal animal rights movement. Um, so they're going to give us a little primer on how to use that. And of course, we're just going to pick Joe's brilliant and creative brain. And this hasn't been announced anywhere yet, folks. Um, so, you know, you're my special folks that come to Lunchtime Live, so you're going to hear it first. But um, we have our next big AJ evening panel, Thursday, February 3rd at 7 p.m. ET. Uh, it's uh, entitled Low Chicken, uh, sorry, Low Carbon Chicken and Regenerative Grazing, How We Can Fight the Greenwashing of Animal Agriculture. So I should have put low carbon chickens in quotes as well. Um, so we know that this is a huge problem, all of the greenwashing that's happening by the anim big animal ag industry. Um, and we are going to have experts, Nicholas Carter, Jennifer Molidor, uh, Audrey Vassil, and Jason Hannon to really break down um, um, what the myths are, the greenwashing myths, and how we most effectively counteract them. Okay, folks, let's get on to the uh, main event. Uh, Kirsten, if you can spotlight Megan and I, that would be amazing. Um, our session today, folks, as I mentioned, is veganic gardening and agriculture, and our guest is Megan Kelly. And let me tell you a little bit about Megan before I uh, allow her to, to speak. <laughs> Um, she's a passionate, um, she's just so passionate about veganic uh, growing and has gardened veganically herself for 14 years. Um, in 2008, Megan co-founded the Veganic Agriculture Network, and um, Kirsten's going to put the link for that in the chat as well, um, to promote plant-based farming and gardening across North America. And she recently started the Learn Veganic online course. Um, we're going to put a, a link in there as well to empower people around the world to grow their own veganic gardens at home. Now, I know my partner, Matt Noble, who is the executive director of the Toronto Vegetarian Food Bank, was one of the first course participants and loved it. And Megan, I just want to welcome you here. I think this is just an amazing topic and so fresh and so alive for our first one of 2022. Well, thanks, Kimberly. It's awesome to be here. And thank you uh, to Debbie for calling me a green giant in the chat. I'm going to take that as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And I was just saying, you just look so fresh. You just, uh, you make me have hope that there's, you know, that there, that there is something in the world that's going to rise up this green, you know, veganic movement and, and, and it's going to heal the earth. Um, so thank you. Just, you, you were like, I just put on a green shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and Megan, we have actually known each other for, we, we're like OGs, right? We yeah. knew each other from back in the Toronto Animal Rights Society, one of the first animal rights groups in Toronto, which I, I think we should give a little bit of a, a, a kudos for, for being sort for sure. of the seedling, which sprung out this incredible um, activism scene, animal activism scene in Toronto. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's been, so we would potluck together and watch really depressing, you know, films. <laughs> <laughs> well, those films helped a lot of people go vegan, so it, it really did. Oh my yeah. God, my first Tars potluck, they were showing earthlings. And I <laughs> immediately, I was vegetarian for a long time, immediately went vegan, immediately became active as an animal rights activist. That was like over 15 years ago. Um, and yeah, it, it fast forwarded me into onto that track. So... Okay, let's get into it because we have so many people from around the world joining us to find out more about veganics. Um, so... 
let's take it back to the very beginning. I know we have some seasoned people here, but we have some people that are really new to be- the idea of veganics. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, veganic, it so- kind of sounds like vegans, kind of sounds like organic. Can you, first of all, explain what veganic means? Yeah, so, so the word veganic itself can be seen as a contraction of either uh, vegetable organic or vegan organic, but it ends up being the same thing no matter how you how you go with the, the root definition. Um, but uh, basically it's plant-based organic agriculture. Um, so, you know, we often think of synthetic agriculture as involving chemicals and then organic, we think of it as something that's being more natural. Uh, but with organic, basically it just means that the uh, fertilizers are uh, organic in origin and not chemical in origin, but an, uh, a fertilizer that's organic in origin can basically be any animal product mineral product or vegetable product. Uh, so you could have, for example, a factory farm that has you know, chickens that are fed antibiotics and uh, you know, chickens that the meat itself could never be sold as organic, but uh, their manure is considered organic fertilizer for the purposes of organic agriculture uh, or their blood or their bone or their feathers can be used in organic agriculture. Um, so basically veganic just cuts that whole animal scene out of, out of the picture and does plant-based organic growing. Uh, so in veganic, we just use plants or uh, minerals uh, as a source of fertility, uh, but we also work with free living animals. So it's not systems that are completely free of animals, it's systems where the animals are completely free. Uh, so instead of, for example, having you know chickens that are added to a system, we'll just work with the birds that naturally live in the area, um, the, the wildlife, uh, so there are still animals in a veganic system, but it's really working with the wildlife that's around us. Oh, amazing. Now, this is, um, uh, you know, I've sort of heard a little bit of dispute over this, but um, just so we get the, the definition right, um, yep. do, does one have to be vegan to be a, a veganic grower? Um, I mean, not necessarily. I mean, the veganic growing refers to the agricultural practices themselves. Okay. Uh, so it's really practicing plant-based farming. Um, although, you know, in most cases, these are things that will go together. Okay, excellent. Now, okay, so Megan, I know that you believe veganic is the future. <laughs> Tell us why. Tell us what it is that veganic can do for our planet and our soil and our air, our water, everything. Tell, you know. So, I mean, I think one of the, the statistics that's, you know, really worrisome for me is, you know, when we look at, you know, that there was a study that was done a few years ago where some scientists decided to see, you know, if you kind of weighed everything in the world, you know, what percentage of its plants, what percentage of it is this or that. And so they, they did a calculation. If you weighed all the land mammals in the world, what percentage of them are wild animals? And I don't know if anyone here knows that stat or if anyone has a guess. If you weighed all the land mammals in the world, what percentage do you think are wild animals? Um, we I, well, I know, so I'm not going to answer, but I'll let people. Um, Debbie says okay. less than 5%. Yeah, less than 5%. So yeah. the, the, the um, calculations that were done a few years ago said around 4%. They're probably lower now, um, but 36% are humans and 60% are domesticated animals. So we're at this point now where there's basically like 15 times more domesticated animals than wild animals in terms of in terms of weight, in terms of biomass, which is a pretty good indication of their relative footprints. And we're in the situation where we're just losing natural ecosystems on such a large scale and largely because so much land is being devoted to animal agriculture uh, and to uh, growing feed for those animals too. So we know that just using a plant-based system is so much more efficient. Um, so, you know, whenever we talk about these kind of protein inefficiencies, for example, of, you know, feeding plants to animals and then getting relatively little back, you know, the, the same goes for, you know, just our agricultural system as a whole, when we're using animals and, um, you know, putting feed through those animals to get something back, um, whether that's meat or whether that's manure or whatever it is, it's just so much more inefficient. So with veganic, we can actually grow more calories and feed more people on a smaller surface, um, which is a way in which we can leave uh, more space for wild animals, more space for ecosystems. And obviously in the process, you know, we can avoid that whole scenario of having all of these domestic animals that, that end up having you know, pretty awful lives and, and uh, 
pretty awful deaths uh, for the most part. So, um, and then in terms of, you know, the environmental side of things, I mean, when we look at chemical agriculture, just that process of taking um, chemical, sorry, of taking nitrogen out of the air and turning it into nitrogen-based fertilizers is extremely fossil fuel intensive. So when we look at, you know, just that general impact, um, the environmental impact of conventional agriculture, so much of that comes from the production of the fertilizers themselves. That's why we sometimes say that, you know, eating locals, nice, but there, there's other factors like the production of chemical fertilizers uh, that actually has a, a larger impact. Um, so, and, and even when we look at things like chemical fertilizers and manure, there's a lot of um, runoff that can happen into uh, waterways. So you can end up with way too many um, nutrients in waterways and that can cause algal blooms, which can really negatively affect uh, the wildlife that, that's in those waterways. Uh, and also with chemical agriculture, uh, especially there's a lot of that um, nitrogen that ends up going back into the air uh, in the form of um, greenhouse gases. So veganic is a system that sort of moves away from chemical agriculture and animal agriculture. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have its own challenges because all types of modern agriculture have their own challenges. You know, using fossil fuel powered machinery, you know, in and of itself, you know, is, is you know, a, a challenge that we don't necessarily automatically get away from when we, when we uh, grow veganically unless we make an effort to move away from that too. But veganic ends up solving a lot of the challenges that come along with modern agriculture. Amazing. So yeah, we're, we're talking uh, basically a remedy for soil erosion, um, the biodiversity that we're losing, um, air quality. Um, it, yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing. So what, I mean, I know that you've been an animal rights activist for a long time, Megan. So uh, when did you discover this and what really, like, why did, why did you decide this is where I need to put my activism? So um, th there was a point at which I, I had been vegan for about five years and I decided you know, that I should learn more about where my food came from and maybe the best way to do that was to grow some of my own. I thought you know, I should start taking responsibility for other aspects of you know, what I'm eating and to, to learn more about where food comes from, to learn how it's grown. And it was at that point that I realized that you know, most farming and most gardening is either gonna be using uh, chemicals or animal products. Uh, and, you know, it's really, really standard even in uh, home scale gardening for people to buy, you know, sheep manure and chicken manure and blood meal and bone meal and, and fish emulsion and, and things like that. Um, so as someone who was vegan, I was like, you know, this isn't the way I want to practice it. I mean, I was a bit bummed out, of course, that that was the way all of my food was being grown that I was buying in the grocery store. But even when it came to doing it hands-on, that was what was being promoted almost everywhere. Um, and um, sometimes on home scale, with home scale gardening, sometimes it'll be veganic by default if people are just using veggie compost. But as soon as we start going into buying products and things like that, or consulting, uh, you know, gardening books and gardening forums, you know, animal products are, are promoted pretty much everywhere. Um, so around that time, I was really lucky. I became best friends with Stefan Grolo, um, who I had been learning about veganic agriculture for about five years before me. So he kind of went through all that hassle of reading all sorts of books going across Europe to meet people in the veganic movement there. Uh, whereas I, got, I had the, um, you know, the pleasure of having all of that information much more quickly and being able to start gardening veganically right from the first season. Um, hey, Stefan. <laughs> yeah, Stefan really helped me. Stefan mm -hmm. was really my mentor in terms of veganic gardening. Um, and he had done a ton of experiments. So he had a website at the time, which he still has called uh, Vegiculture. It's like V-E-G-E culture.net, uh, which is a French language website where he shows his gardens basically for like the last 18 years or something. And um, so I was able to jump straight into gardening veganically. Uh, and at the time I was really looking for uh, a place to do effective activism where maybe there was, um, you know, a role to be played that wasn't being played at the time. Uh, and Stefan had really wanted to promote veganics for several years, but French is his first language. So we sort of banded together to form a bilingual team and uh, to promote veganic agriculture in North America, because at the time, uh, you know, veganic agriculture already had 
a good platform in the UK through the Vegan Organic Network, but there was nothing at the time in North America. So that's when we founded the Veganic Agriculture Network back in 2008, just to make sure it had some, some representation and that uh, we could start networking between farmers. Amazing. You know, um, I, I and, and we talk about this a lot in Animal Justice Academy. I mean, a, a part of starting Animal Justice Academy was because we didn't want people who wanted to help animals to think there was only one way to help, you know, like mm -hmm. standing there with a sign yelling at people, uh, which is <laughs> effective, obviously an effective thing sometimes, um, but we can't have everybody doing that. We've got to have people in every sector of society <laughs> working towards animals. So, so uh, we really promote and, and, and try to showcase all the different places that people can um, bring their passion for, for animal advocacy um, and all the, and all the offshoots of, of, of growing a compassionate world, whether it's environmental um, issues, social justice issues. And so, you know, that's what you did. You, you found something that um, A, wasn't being served uh, in, mm -hmm. in your mm -hmm. area. Um, you chose something that you had an especial interest, curio curiosity, and passion. And we do need that to make it sustainable in our life. We need to choose something that, that we're going to enjoy to a, an extent. Um, and so, so yeah, so it's, it's a beautiful illustration of, of sort of what we really encourage in AJA. So you, you mentioned that the movement was sort of going strong in the UK. Um, tell us a little bit about the veganic movement and where did the sort of it start bubbling up and the first sort of references to it happen and and whereabouts is it in its, uh, you know, uh, evolution? Like it still feels like it's it's kind of, it's not an infant, but it still feels like it's a bit of a young child right now. Yeah, I would have said infancy, but maybe it's a toddler now. Yeah. Um, but um, <laughs> The, the first mentions were back uh, in the 1950s in newsletters from a vegan organization in England. It, it may have been the Vegan Society, but I can't I can't remember for sure. Uh, and then there were some books published uh, in the 1980s called Veganic Gardening by um, O'Brien Dalziel or something like that. I can't quite remember the last names exactly, um, but um, that was what really kind of set things off. Um, and then in the 90s, there was the Vegan Organic Network that was formed in England. Um, and they really have an international scope, but a lot of their members are from England. And then uh, we started our uh, network, Veganic Agriculture Network in 2008. Uh, there was a group in um, California that started up called Seed the Commons um, in maybe, maybe around 2016, but I, it might have been earlier than that. Um, and you know, it's interesting because maybe in the last uh, three or four years, I've seen three or four books published about veganic gardening, whereas before there was sort of only one and then a few others that were kind of incidentally veganic. Um, you know, there's there's some techniques, for example, you know, there was a woman named Ruth Stout who came up with a technique for fertilizing completely with hay. So instead of, you know, feeding hay to a cow and taking the manure, well, you just feed your garden with hay. But that's that's a technique that's sort of incidentally veganic rather than intentionally veganic, but we can really see now that there's more books coming out that are specific uh, to veganics. Um, but I would say when we look at where the movement is, you know, even though it's sort of been around for a few decades, you know, it, it's been around in a very small way, um, I would compare it to the vegan movement or the organic movement back in the 1970s. Um, so, you know, I tell people, you know, gardening veganically today is like, uh, being vegan in the 1970s, you know, people made their own tofu. Uh, they certainly couldn't go out to the supermarket and pick up what they want. And veganic is kind of like that today. I mean, if you want to eat veganically, you have to get your hands dirty. You can't just go to the supermarket and grab your, what you want. And um, for environmental reasons, to begin with, we really encourage people to um, grow their own fertilizers or uh, get organic matter from the waste stream that they can reclaim as a way of fertilizing their garden. Um, but it, it also makes it easier too, because if you go to a typical garden center, you might find that a lot of the stuff there is animal based in one way or another. Um, you certainly can buy some veganic products on the market, but kind of like being vegan back in the 1970s, you know, it was a, it's a little bit few and far between. Um, and, but I think when, when we look at the organic movement, you know, I have a very clear memory of hearing about organic for the first time in the late 90s. I have a clear memory of eating my first vegan organic apple because I went and specifically bought an organic apple just to see what it was. 
Um, whereas when we look at how much the organic movement has snowballed and how much the vegan movement has snowballed, it's been incredible, both of them in the last 20 years, uh, how much more widely available things are now. So I think it gives hope that veganic can also snowball. It's just a very small snowball for the moment. So, you know, it still needs to, to pick up a, a few layers. And you're right. I mean, think about even 20 years ago to find a vegan cookbook, almost impossible. And now they're everywhere. So I'm I'm hoping this movement is going to snowball much faster um, because yeah. it really just does seem like the answer. The answer to so many of our planetary problems and so mm -hmm. many problems, well, around animal agriculture in general. Um, and that's the thing that we do have to acknowledge. I mean, it's also it's also good for the animals. I mean, sure. uh, a lot of this stuff that's used for uh, gardening um, or you know it, it, the fertilizer and everything can be considered a byproduct but it's still part of the system. It's still part of what yeah. props up the system is yeah, the money that's coming in from the, these byproducts, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it still helps finance uh, the animal agriculture system to use these products. And, um, you know, if, if I don't want to eat an animal, I don't want to grow my tomatoes with that animal either. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't make any more sense to me. And, you know, one of the reasons why um, we were interested in, in promoting veganics too is because sometimes there's a skepticism about whether it's even possible. So that's one thing we're trying to kind of lay that groundwork that yes, we can move away from the animal agriculture system. No, we're not dependent on the animal agriculture system, but also we need some of those um, really pioneering farmers right now, testing different methods, testing them in different climates, figuring out what works um, and sharing information with each other. Because of course we want to see the end of animal agriculture and we want, you know, and you know, hopefully <laughs> quickly, but however long it takes. And, uh, you know, the veganic movement would, in terms of techniques, the veganic movement needs to stay ahead of that transition away from animal agriculture, because if we want that transition to happen, we need, um, you know, really good viable methods for people to be doing plant-based agriculture that are ready to go so people can make that transition in one season. Yeah, I mean, because right now it's probably being dismissed, you know, most uh, most of culture believes you need animal manure to grow plants, right? And so you're, we need stats, you know, we need data, um, mm -hmm. we need, you know, I think anecdotally, most people that are doing veganic growing know that it, it works, but we mm -hmm. need we need some of the data to, you know, to uh, back that up. And I know, and you know, um, that at the Toronto Vegetarian Food Bank, we're actually starting a veganic farm this summer, well, Absolutely. this spring. And, um, and so we hope to be part of that experiment um, with the data. Um, yeah. So Megan, uh, you know, can you do, like, just for those that are like, well, I don't know if, you know, are we just doing this for activism or is it, d does this actually make for better growing? Like, is it just environmentally sound, like we're doing the right thing? Or is there actually a possibility that it could grow things even better? So um, one thing I'll just mention is, you know, I, I think especially with veganism, we always kind of hear these questions about, you know, where do you get your calcium, where do you get your protein and, and this and that. And, you know, there's these cultural associ associations we have, like milk is equated with calcium and, you know, steak is equated with protein. And you kind of have to go through that deconstruction of that concept to say, well, wait a sec, the cow just got its calcium from plants the cow got its protein from plants. And, you know, that's the same question we kind of hear in, um, in veganic is kind of where do you get your nitrogen? And, you know, <laughs> hilarious. So where did the nitrogen in the manure come from? I mean, it came from whatever the cow ate, you know? And I mean, when we give the example that you can fertilize with hay, I mean, hay is basically fertilizing with a whole food, whereas fertilizing with manure would be fertilizing with hay after the cow took a bunch of stuff out of it. Um, so, you know, the, the hay is more of a whole food than manure is. Um, so in that sense, the thing to remember is that animals and animal products are just storing what was in plants. It's just another form of the plants that they ate. Uh, so they're not actually creating anything new. Um, the one thing that, I mean, I think some people would say is they might be concentrating some of the nutrients, which could be true up to a certain point. So with, with veganic, you'd sometimes use larger quantities um, because, you know, you would use, instead of having kind of a lot of hay fed to a cow and using the manure, you would start with a lot of hay. So in, it, in the end with veganic, it's more efficient in the sense that we're using less materials, but you might find that 
the amount of materials you're physically adding to your garden is a little bit bigger um, than, than with uh, animal products. Um, but one thing I really like about Veganic is the fact that we really have that opportunity to grow our own fertilizers right where we are. Um, so, you know, nitrogen, for example, you know, in chemical agriculture, you know, this is really fossil fuel intensive process to get it out from the air into a chemical fertilizer because about 80% uh, about of the air that's around us is nitrogen. Um, but uh, in natural ecosystems, the way nitrogen gets into the soil is through nitrogen fixing bacteria. Uh, so there's some little bacteria here and there that are free floating uh, that fix nitrogen, but there's also nitrogen bacteria that associate, uh, associate with legume plants. So legume plants that can be things like peas and beans, but like clover is also a legume plant and alfalfa is also a legume plant. Uh, so they'll have uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria living in their little root nodules. And those uh, bacteria are basically just taking nitrogen straight out of the air and sharing it with the plant. And in exchange, the plant is photosynthesizing and creating sugars and sharing some of them, uh, some of those sugars with uh, the bacteria. Uh, so for example, just having a lawn that's a clover lawn, you've got a nitrogen fixing lawn in that case, and you're actually bringing nitrogen into the system. Or things like, things like red clover can actually be quite decorative. So if you have a front yard area that you're trying to keep nice and pretty for the neighbors, you can grow things like decorative clovers and things like that. And then you're basically growing your own fertilizer on site. I mean, hay is essentially a mix of grasses and legume plants. So if you have some decorative grasses and some decorative legume plants, you're basically growing your own hay and you can grow that in your front yard and then fertilize your backyard veggie garden with it. Uh, so there's so many opportunities uh, with veganic um, also, even just for reclaiming um, materials from the waste system, I mean, leaves are a fantastic form of, uh, you know, minerals and um, a source of minerals and a way to build up the soil. So, I mean, when we think about minerals that are used in agriculture, often those are from open pit mines that are really destroying ecosystems, uh, whereas trees naturally mine minerals from the ground that, that's right in our neighborhood. Uh, so they have these root systems that, and that are in re relationships with microorganisms. Those microorganisms help uh, the trees access minerals. The trees bring that up to their leaves, then the leaves fall. And those leaves are a wonderful source of minerals and a great source of carbon too, to help regenerate your soil and build it up. And people just treat that like it's a waste product. A lot of people will throw out leaves and then buy in wood chips and things like that. I mean, wood chips can be great too in their own way if they're used properly in gardening. Um, but, uh, you know, these are things that even if you don't have your own trees, there's probably other people throwing out leaves in your neighborhood. You know, so there's just some, some wonderful ways that we can create systems that are incredibly sustainable uh, and where we don't even necessarily need to buy anything. Because if we just start to see waste products as resources, uh, there's so many ways that we can garden. Um, in ways that are great for animals and for the earth. Amazing, Megan. So, um, yeah, there, I mean, I just listen to you and I just go, plants are so fucking amazing. Excuse yeah. my language, but they are <laughs> like, yeah, oh my are. God, what they do. Even if you think about it, like if you think about what we're made out of, like we're made out of plants, but what are plants made out of? They're made out of the air, water, and the sun, you know? So yeah, I mean, we're big wusses compared to plants. Like... <laughs> They, they do all the hard work. <laughs> I know, but I mean, when you even think about the fact that, you know, we're moving and we have energy, I mean, that's basically all coming from sunlight and from the air that was kind of stocked by the plants and then we ate it. I mean, it's all pretty fascinating stuff, but yeah, plants plants play an awesome role and uh, they, they do so many amazing things and have so many connections, um, you know, with other natural elements. Well, okay, so um, folks, um, we are welcoming your questions now. Uh, star, star, star Q for questions. And I can't guarantee we're gonna get to all of them, um, but we are, we'll do our best. But Megan, uh, what I, you know, so you've got this Learn Veganic course where you yep. really take people from A, a to Z as far as um, gardening uh, veganically. Um, so, and and just so folks know, um, I, I think you've got a new session coming up really soon, yep. right? Yeah. So we have a new session that's starting on February 9th and it's um, a seven week course. 
And uh, as Kimberly said, her partner Matt joined us last year. And one of the things we just loved about the course last year was just how many awesome people there were in the course. So we do like Q&A meetups every week where people can ask questions and share their experiences. And then we also have live classes every week that people can also watch video replays. So people can really join us from anywhere around the world. And uh, and it's it's good times. I'm really, really looking forward to, to running the class again. Yeah. And so um, Kirsten's going to put the link for that in uh, the comments again, just so you know, because when does it start? Megan? Uh, February, February 9th. February 9th. And I believe you've got an early bird pricing until there the end of January, right? Yeah, and guys, yeah. I, I'm, I, you know, I'm going to have to have a talk with Megan because it's super cheap. I think you have to raise your prices. Um, it's like uh, it's 180 bucks. Uh, yeah, so you know what? it's we, yeah. we we'd rather keep it accessible. Yeah, you know, I, know. I mean, I know. there's I a lot it. of situations where people raise prices, but I'd much rather have more people joining us at an accessible price because we'd like to to have more people learning about this and and doing their own veganic gardens. Totally. Well, you, you, this is coming from the person that's been running a free a program for a year. So I guess I should just shut up. <laughs> um, yes, we, it's so important. This is such an important topic and we do want to keep it so accessible. Um, so folks, um, I, I really apologize. We are having a problem with the Zoom chat um, and being able to copy and paste. Um, you can, if you uh, if you click on a link, it will that will work, but you're just not able to do a copy and paste. I think I did something wrong. Um, so I if um, if you are wanting to see the chat, um, what I'll do is I'm going to put it in our uh, under the live stream uh, in the Facebook group. Um, I'm going to put it in one of the comments so that you can access it after the fact. OK, and I'm going to do my best to just uh, catch your questions as they come. Now, Megan, um, just, you know, for all of us that are, are planning our gardens for mm -hmm. the spring, um, can you give us a little little primer, a little something that we sh some some things that we should know, some ways to get Get started? I mean, I think that in general, it's great to get a head start, you know, a year or two before you need materials, oftentimes. So I, I always just tell people to start composting right away uh, because, you know, a lot of compost on the market may not be veganic. Uh, sometimes that's all we have available. Um, but I think just doing home composting of our fruits and veggies is really one of the best places to start. Um, if you're trying to start a garden this spring and you really have you know, no materials to work with, or you're just really getting started, especially if you have no soil. Uh, one thing you could consider doing is a veganic lasagna garden, uh, which is basically a compost pile that you end up uh, planting into. So it's good to get it started, you know, as early as you can. Um, this could involve buying some soil in, but also doing, um, basically it's alternating layers of carbon rich materials, which could be kind of, you know, shredded leaves or, uh, straw or hay or things like that. And then nitrogen rich materials, which can be your, your veggie scraps, or it could be alfalfa meal pellets that you could buy or things like that. Um, so it basically involves just piling them up till they're about <laughs> two feet high, letting it sit for a few weeks, having a layer of soil near the top that you can plant into directly. But basically it's a way to uh, create a new garden by essentially planting into a compost pile. But there's so many other ways that you can garden. Um, I would also just suggest, you know, looking for what resources you have in your neighborhoods. Are there things that you can reclaim? Are there places that you can get more composting materials from? Uh, there's a lot of, um, you know, restaurants and uh, grocery stores and places like that that are just throwing out fruits and veggies all the time. So if you're able to get a hold of some of those materials, that would be great. Um, but if you're just looking for something really simple that you can just buy as a product, um, there's a uh, West Coast Seeds, if we're talking about Canada here, I think a lot of people are from Canada. West Coast Seeds has a product, I think it's called Vegano 333 or something like that. And that's um, a something that people can buy that, that's kind of a mix of uh, veganic uh, fertilizers. Um, a lot of uh, agricultural co-ops and garden centers will have alfalfa meal for sale. Sometimes it's actually sold essentially as, as rabbit feed. Um, so uh, there's ways that you could pick up alfalfa and that's a nitrogen rich product uh, that you could use to fertilize your garden with uh, basically just by sprinkling a little on the top or mixing it up in your soil. Or the way I like to do it is to take some alfalfa, add some water, let it sit for about 24 hours. I throw in a handful of the compost too to get some microbial activity in there. 
uh, and then it really starts to break down and that's a quick way we can give a, a boost to our plants in the spring. So there's actually a ton of different techniques, Kimberly, so it's a, it's a little bit hard to, to go with what are the tricks and tips because there's, you know, there's so many possibilities. Ah. Um, and so, so say that somebody has, um, you know, I mean, just a little overview of, of kind of what folks might have to learn to be able to do veganic properly. Um, like, so I go back with the, the composting, uh, your compost. I mean, we're talking putting all your fruits and veggies into a bin at, like outside. And how long does that have to stay in the bin for? So it depends. I mean, basically until it looks like dirt. Um, so the one thing you want to make sure of when you're especially starting out with composting, well, not just when you're starting out all the time, but it's the thing that we tend to forget when we're, when we're beginners, is that you need to add brown materials to your compost too. So if you just add veggie scraps, that's not a compost pile, it's a garbage bin, and it's going to end up smelling like a garbage bin. But if you add um, with your uh, veggie scraps, if you add in a handful of leaves or a handful of cardboard or a handful of shredded newspaper, um, that's what it's going to kind of combine with to have the right carbon nitrogen ratio to break down. So you're going to have a very unpleasant experience if you just put your veggie scraps. Um, and you want to make sure that there's a way that any liquid can drain out. So you don't want to do it in a closed container. You want to do it in a container that's either in contact with the ground or that it's got some little holes in the bottom. Um, and it needs to get some air in there too. So you don't want something that's totally like hermetically sealed. You need something that can get a little bit of air flowing in. Amazing. And then any, like, I mean, I know it depends what it is, but any idea how long we need to do that for, to, for it to be so, viable? So it depends. I mean, I, I always just tell people once it looks like dirt, you can use it in your okay. garden, right? Okay, once you've got, got something that looks like dirt and smells like dirt. It's uh, dirt. It, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have a, where, where I am in Quebec, we have a six month winter. So it's going to take me six months longer to compost compared to someone in California because, you know, I, I just have this time of the year where everything freezes. Um, there are some ways to compost in the winter, but it's, it's a lot more uh, intensive um, a process. But I mean, there are some people that will have composting processes that will take about, you know, two months because they've got a special technique and a lot of aeration and they're getting their carbon nitrogen ratios perfect. Um, but if you just kind of go with a passive technique where you're just throwing some, you know, veggie scraps and some leaves in a bin, uh, it could take anywhere from like six months to a year. So it depends on a lot of things. It depends how small everything was chopped up because if it's a bit smaller, like more finely chopped up, it'll decompose quicker. But don't put it in a blender because it needs some air. So you don't want everything to be a liquid slush either. So all of these things that you're like, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. I'm like, I would have done that. I would have done that. I would have done that. <laughs> so thank you for clarifying. Yeah. But you know, Obviously, I'm, I'm not the composter in the household. <laughs> yeah. But my, my favorite technique for composting, which, you know, you know, Marco, um, yes. Marco came up with a technique for composting on a balcony, which I absolutely adore. Uh, basically, it would involve, you know, if we had a, imagine that there's no plant here. <laughs> Let's just forget about the plant. Imagine if I had a pot like this, and if inside of it, I put a bottomless bucket. So basically you take a food grade bucket, cut off the bottom, put it in here, and then you could basically put your food scraps into the bucket, but you'd still have a ring of dirt around the bucket where you could grow plants. So Marco came up with this technique for, for a balcony composter, um, and it's basically just one big pot, a bucket inside, a ring of dirt between the two, and a little bit of dirt on the bottom too. And basically any compost liquid that comes out is going to help uh, fertilize those plants. Uh, but it's a way of having kind of an incognito uh, compost bin on a balcony. And, you know, it can, you know, it's maybe enough for one person's uh, composting if they're not producing too much. And if people need more composters, they can just make more balcony composters. But it's it's a great concept and it's really easy to do. Uh, courtesy of Marco pa Pagliaro. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Marco. Yeah. I mean, he's not here, but that's amazing. He's, he's yeah, brilliant. We've got a, an article about it on goveganic.net. If you go to goveganic.net and look at balcony composting, you'll find uh, some DIY instructions for it. Perfect. Well, while we're on the topic of balconies, um, Ralph is asking, are there specific veganic recommendations for container gardening? Yeah, I mean, 
In terms of specific recommendations, I mean, I guess it can just be a little bit tougher to find some of the commercial products that you might otherwise buy because a lot of commercial products are going to have some animal products in them. Um, so we have a, an article up on the Veganic Agriculture Network website. We have a specific gardening how-to section. And in one of those articles, it lists some of the products that people can buy um, that are kind of ready to go for container gardens. Uh, but again, something like alfalfa can actually work really well. Um, in our vegan, or in, on our in our container gardens in the city, um, we actually use one technique that's technically not veganic, um, but it doesn't involve domesticated animals. Um, so one thing you can actually do is just water down your own pee. Uh, so if you water down your own pee with about 20 parts water to one part pee, uh, that's actually really high nitrogen. So Again, it's not technically veganic. It could never qualify in sort of, you know, commercial veganic agriculture or anything like that. Um, but I consider it, you know, I bite my own fingernails as a vegan. I guess I can put my own pee into my garden. So it's I kind of- No, it is it technically it's annual, animal waste, human animal yeah. waste, but it's not causing any harm. <laughs> it's not causing any harm in that case, but um, um, yeah. But yep. otherwise, otherwise it's pretty similar. Um, container gardening to veganically uh, versus non-veganically. If you can get a hold of just enough veggie compost, then it's that simple. There, you know, if you have enough veggie compost, you don't need anything else. While we're talking about urine, um, how's this for a segue? Um, is there anything you do to mitigate wildlife? Um, just uh, looking at if you have rescued farmed individuals to help minimize any possible predators that come along with attracting more deer, et cetera, with your edible plants. That's from Syrian. I'm not sure if I totally got the question. I'm not sure either. Let's let's just let's just deal with: Is there anything you can do to mitigate a wildlife eating your plants? So, I mean, I would just go with physical barriers if there's really an issue. Um, what we tend to do is the opposite. We just tend to invite wildlife. I mean, that's part of kind of the purpose of our gardens is to, rather than mitigating wildlife issues, it's more to you know mitigate biodiversity loss by. Uh, you know, trying to attract biodiversity as much as possible. Um, but I understand that if somebody has a little garden patch and <laughs> there's deer coming and eating everything, if you're out in the countryside, well, you might not be that thrilled about it. So in that case, I would suggest putting up a fence and maybe giving a little garden for, for the deer right outside of it or something. Um, but, I, you know, we generally find that um, by focusing on biodiversity, we always end up with a lot of interesting things to eat. So when I say, you know, we want to attract biodiversity, but also we try to plant for biodiversity. So instead of planting like four things, we'll tend to plant like 30 different things. And then I don't really care if three or four of them get eaten. Um, but when we plant like four different things and two of them disappear because some animals can eat them, yeah, it can be a bit of a bummer. Um, so I, I really go with the idea of having as much biodiversity as possible and just accepting that there's going to be some losses. Um, but, you know, if I had, um, a commercial project or something like that, then I would probably use uh, row covers and fences and things like that if, if there were really issues. So there's no, there's no um, substance that we can make that's a magic, it's any sort of magical substance. And maybe not even just for wildlife, but I'm sure a lot of people are, are thinking about um, insect sort of in, infestations yeah. as well. So in most cases, you, you basically have, a, I mean, I'm gonna oversimplify here a little, but in general, you can invite everyone or you can get rid of everyone. And it's really hard to be selective. Um, and usually, even in cases where we're using something that's natural and that seems nice, you know, if it's negatively affecting the species that you'd like to have leave, it's probably negative affecting, negatively affecting a lot of other species too. Um, so there, there's very few ways that you can, you know, add substances um, to, to, to get rid of certain animals and certain insects without negatively affecting all the good guys. Um, so we just kind of accept the ones that, <laughs> that show up that maybe eat a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Um, one thing, for example, I, I had a garden that had a lot of slugs in it. And I found that I would want to have five beans. So I'd plant five beans and they'd come along and eat them. So instead I started planting 20 beans and they'd eat some and a bunch of them would get through. And you know, once they're uh, better established, the slugs aren't going to eat them. So I've just find, found that you know, in nature, that's what happens. Like plants send out thousands of seeds. 
what we do in, in farms or gardens is sometimes we plant the number that we want and then we get upset when some of them disappear. So maybe if we just planted a bit more, I, it wouldn't be as, as big of a deal. So we just try to accept the animals that are there because I think basically they were there first. We showed up and we put concrete everywhere and we cut down their habitats. And so I really see it as habitat, uh, you know, reestablishing habitats more than anything. And, you know, if I was a commercial grower and it was really, you know, affecting things negatively, yeah, then I, then I would put up some physical barriers in some cases. But, you know, about 97% of insects are beneficial or neutral for our gardens. So I don't think we need to take that many steps uh, to, to chase away the 3% and, and maybe other, a lot of other ones in the process. And the other thing is like something like aphids, for example, you know, if you have aphids, usually it will end up attracting ladybugs because ladybugs eat aphids. Whereas if you just keep getting rid of the aphids, you're probably always going to have aphids because you never have ladybugs. So for us, we just see it as we attract one trophic level and then another and then another, and then we keep getting a more and more complex ecosystem. And we see that as a, as a win when we attract animals. I love that paradigm shift, Megan. And yeah, it's just like, if we're making a garden a little bit, you know, a little bit for our animal friends or, you know, insect and mammals um, and, and some for us. And, yeah. um, and I, and I, and I, from what I understand, the healthier the soil is that we've built, the less um, things are going to get ravaged on the top level. Yeah, that's true. I mean, sometimes when uh, plants get eaten by insects a little bit. It could be a sign that the plant is uh, is a little bit sicker. But one one thing that's interesting too, actually, um, and I don't I don't have too much info about this, but there were some studies done about uh, antioxidants in plants. You know, and antioxidants make plants healthier for us because antioxidants are are protective for us. And anyway, there were some studies that showed that uh, basically plants that are being attacked by insects produce more antioxidants because the plants will produce the antioxidants to try to, to, to get rid of that insect infestation. So theoretically speaking, if we have kale that's being munched on and things like that, that kale might actually be higher in antioxidants for us and might actually be healthier. Now, I mean, I can't wow. necessarily confirm that, but you know, I, I like to see it that way too, that some of these things that we see as a big negative, um, it, they are big negatives if you're a commercial farmer with really picky consumers who don't want to buy anything that doesn't look perfect. But when it's your own backyard, you know, honestly, you can just rinse it off and eat it and, and it's not a problem. Um, Jay, Jay said, I love your attitude and solutions, Megan. You're a woman after my own heart. <laughs> yes, I think we're, lo we're loving what you're saying here. Um, Mel R is asking, what is your position on using peat moss? What would be the best alternatives to help retain water and aerate the soil as a replacement? Okay, so peat moss, I mean, it's it's a material that's technically veganic because it's you know plant-based. However, it's its extraction ends up basically destroying certain ecosystems and causing um, uh, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions because it's a really important carbon sink. So, I mean, I would say to avoid peat moss where possible. Uh, sometimes people will end up using peat moss during their first year or two when they're first getting started with their seedlings. But I'd say to put in place a plan to stop using it. Um, with, with, you know, as, as soon as you can. So one of the main ways to do that is to make leaf mold. Um, so peat moss, I mean, the advantage of it is that it's, you know, it's something that can really hold on to a lot of liquid, uh, you know, and it just kind of creates just a really nice moisture level, especially when we have seedlings. Uh, so that's one of the main things that it's used for. But one thing to keep in mind is it wasn't even used until basically a few decades ago. So before that, people were using other solutions uh, like leaf mold. Leaf mold, it's the most simple thing in the world you could make as long as you've got some space to make it. You basically collect a bunch of leaves, leave them in a pile, and that's it. You just come back when it looks like dirt, and then you start using it in your garden or using it in your seedlings. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to turn it. You don't have to do anything at all. Um, ideally, like a meter cubed or more is the best, but you can even take a bunch of leaves, uh, slightly moist leaves, throw them into a garbage bag, tie it up, poke a few holes for aeration, and just put it under under your patio and just come back two years later and you've got leaf mold. I 
Amazing. So yeah, so this does take a little bit of more long term planning. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I guess we don't have to shoot for perfection the first year, we can start oh. playing with some techniques and then and mm -hmm. then start setting our mind for, you know, where we can go fully veganic. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, Megan, there. Well, one more question, I think, um, that we maybe have time for. Um, this has come up a couple of times. Um, there was someone earlier in the conversation. Sorry, I'm, uh, it's gone through past so fast. That was just talking about, you know, that they have a shelter with rabbits, and that the rabbits, you know, that she uses their um, their poop, you know, as manure. And then Debbie's talking about this may not be considered vegan per se, but I'm. Uh, uh, what if, in a way, you were to divert from the landfill, someone wanted to use Waste products from their companion animals as fertilizer, <laughs> manure shavings. Um, but I think that these questions, they sort of defeat the purpose of what you're talking about. Am I, am I right? Yeah, I mean, I consider it as something that's kind of a parallel movement on the side, which is kind of growing with, you know, sanctuary manure, growing with the manure of, of rescued animals. So, I mean, it is something that in terms of the idea of not exploiting animals, it, it meets that goal. So that's why I see it as a parallel movement that is kind of, you know, that that we can collaborate with. Um, but, you know, with Veganic, we're really trying to promote plant-based organic uh, to, to show that it's really possible and to show that we can move away from having domesticated animals. Um, and even in terms of uh, things like uh, e. coli, you know, that's another nice thing about Veganic is you're not getting all of these pathogens. Um, so if people are uh, growing non-veganically with, you know, the manure from rescued animals, one thing is stay away from carnivores, you know, or, or you know, cats, for example, any, any animal that's eaten meat, because that's going to be particularly high in pathogens, something like rabbits, it's a bit safer. Um, it's quite a bit safer, but uh, it's not something that I know a lot about because I've really focused on plant-based organic agriculture. So, so I don't have any experience with, um, with composting manure. Yeah, so technically that would be vegan because it's not causing any harm to animals. Animals aren't being used or abused, but it's not veganic. It's yeah, exactly. Basically vegan, but not veganic. Exactly. Yeah, got it. Got it. Well, oh my God, Megan, that was amazing. I I learned a lot, even though Matt talks about this stuff all the time. I still learned, maybe I was paying more attention to you than I do to Matt. Um, but no, he's been really great at, at educating me some with this with this stuff. Um, I really, and everything I've heard, Veganic really, it is the future. Um, and I'm so happy that people like you are out there and you're leading this movement um, at, because it really does check off all the boxes that we need in this world right now. So so let's just one more time, the Learn Veganic um, course that's starting uh, beginning of February. Uh, Kirsten, I'll put it in the chat one more uh, time, folks. And if, you know, even if you're not interested in doing it, it's a great thing to um, pass along. I'm going to post it in the Facebook group as well, just as a separate post so that folks can uh, check it out. Uh, again, they over deliver. I, I always heard like they, they were just doing so much for the folks that were part of that course. They were so available, um, great lessons. And um, so if anybody's really interested in in learning more, this is the way to do it. Um, they'll, they'll hold your hand and take you through every part of it. Right, Megan? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, and it's such a great community too that's built. And that's one thing we really loved about it. And uh, we're really looking forward to meeting new veganic uh, enthusiasts this year. And I just want to mention too, that you can follow us on Facebook. Uh, we'll have some uh, other events coming up and, and webinars that will be in, uh, I know Nation Rising, uh, which is a group that, um, that advocates for, uh, you know, ending animal subsidies in Canada and, and putting that money toward animal agriculture. They're planning to do um, an event about veganics uh, in the future. So there's things like that. If you'd like to find out about it, you can follow us on Facebook. And, uh, and we have a lot of little gardening tips and tricks on our Facebook too. Perfect. That's amazing. Well, Ms. What, what did uh, Debbie call you, Ms. Green Giant? <laughs> Um, thank you so much. Yes. No, she's calling you the green machine now. You're now the oh, green thank machine. You, Debbie. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, and Diana said, uh, thank you, Megan. Fascinating. So important for our planet, our animals and us. And I fully agree. Um, so animal justice folks, thank you so much for showing up and, uh, you know, spreading the word about this. We had a great turnout today. Um, 55 uh, um, at, at one point here and a bunch of people on Facebook live and lots of people watching um, the replay. Hello to you and thanks for joining. Don't forget that the next Lunchtime Live is in two weeks um, on Thursday, January
January 27th. Oh, by the way, Kirsten, you can take us off spotlight. Um, and it is finding the right visuals for your animal advocacy with Joanne MacArthur and Victoria DeMarnie of uh, We Animals Media. So if you haven't already, folks, um, go to uh, the uh, gallery page so that you can see all your folks again, because you probably got booted onto speaker view. And let's give Megan Kelly a proper AJ. Thank you. <laughs> Megan, thank, thank you. you so much. We love you yeah. and we'll, we'd love to have you back sometime. All right. Thank yeah, you all great. for joining us. And um, sorry, Megan, you enjoyed yourself. Oh, it was great. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for having me. Our pleasure. And folks, we'll see you here in two weeks. And uh, hopefully, if you aren't part of Animal Justice Academy, you'll join us um, by going to animaljusticeacademy.com. All right, everybody, let's make 2022 the best for us and for the animals. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye bye.